Hello and welcome to Salon London. I'm Nikki Hodgson and we welcome you to our world at a time when many are tuning into a certain other channel to listen to a certain other politico tonight. You've made the right choice. We're really glad to have you with us. <laughs> so tonight I am in conversation with Ian Dunt. Ian is a political journalist, broadcaster and the editor of politics.co.uk, appearing regularly across the national media and he's a co-presenter of the Romaniacs podcast. He's a prolific and substantial tweeter. Trust me, his Twitter feed is your daily politics rundown. And he's also the, the author of the best-selling book, Brexit, What the Hell Happens Next? And now, How to Be a Liberal, the story of liberalism and the fight for its life. So just to explain the format of tonight, I'll be talking with Ian for about 45 minutes and then I'll throw it open to questions. If you're on the Zoom chat, then we want you to pop them in the chat on Zoom. If you're watching on YouTube, then pop them in the chat function there. And you'll also be able to buy the book at the end of the salon, and we'll tell you more about that later. If you've signed up for the virtual book signing, that's just a few of you, stick around at the end of the session, and we'll be getting Ian to do that for you. So with no further ado, let's welcome Ian. Ian, hello. Hey, how are you doing? I'm really well, how are you? Good, yeah, not too bad, actually, yeah. You know, catastrophic existential despair, the usual, but no worse than you. <laughs> the usual. Just another day for you, isn't it, really? Yeah, it's pretty much bog, bog standard. It's just sort of lies and incompetence and evasion and an ideological assault on everything I've believed in. But it, it's pretty much rudimentary, yeah. But you've made it your profession to fight it, haven't you? So here you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So Ian, firstly, congratulations on the book because it really is a monumental achievement. I read it over uh, a holiday in Greece, as you know, mm. and um, it really filled in a huge amount of gap that I had about the history of liberalism. And also everyone knows that I'm a political journalist some of the time, and there are lots of things that I don't know about or things that I've got the wrong end of the stick from, and your book really helped me to kind of get the sense of those. Um, it's really well written and really lightly written as well, I need to say. So you, you've done a brilliant job. Thanks, man. Um, but yeah, let, let's get in and talk about it. So first of all, how long had you been thinking about writing it? Yeah, it, you know what? There was like a year period where all the stuff was sort of bouncing around in here and I couldn't really... I couldn't really sort of structure it into one thing to say. There was like, I remember even when I was very young, I remember doing a speech at like sort of 15, 16, I had this uh, teacher um, who sort of took me for a walk and was just like, you only really need just one thing that you're trying to say. And once you found that, all of these disparate ideas around you will just sort of start to lock into place, but you've got to have that destination. And I had about a year of sort of just being in a bit of a wash and a mess and thinking, I don't know how to do this until my publisher basically just said, I want you to write a book called How to Be a Liberal. And the second that he said the words, you just sort of thought, it, I could see the boxes just click into place. You could see the direction of the argument. I knew how to approach it. I knew what the narrative would be. It changed a bit, obviously, but I knew the general storyline. And that just sort of locked into place. Now, I've said this before, but like, if you can find someone in your working life who in one sentence, or at least, you know, not to be too strict about it, like very briefly, will explain to you the thing that you wish to be working on, you should hold that person quite tightly because they're worth their weight in gold, basically. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And I, I would agree with that as an author myself, actually. You really need somebody who's absolutely got you back from the start. Mm. So you start the book with Descartes. And I really wanted to know, why start here in particular? And what does liberalism owe Descartes? Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, so that's weird on a number of levels. I mean, the first one is that he's not really a liberal and he's not really ever kind of processed into political thought. You know, he's dealing predominantly with metaphysics, uh, which is sort of study of reality and epistemology, which is the, the study of what you can know and the study of knowledge. Um, uh, so he's an odd place to start. I also, I also kind of think he is a bit of a twat. Like, um, he, like he's quite unlikable. I, whenever you come across his writings, his letters, like he is just fucking insufferable he's a very very hard man to like and when I was studying philosophy in university I studied philosophy in university which is a, a fucking terrible era basically like I did way too much drugs uh when I was doing a level and I just thought oh maybe I should you know do something and think about is the table really there and then you study philosophy which is actually very very rigid and very difficult and you think I have made a terrible error here you know the main argument for why kids should not do drugs is because if it goes really, really badly wrong, you're going to end up studying philosophy. And that is not something that you want to happen in your life. And during that period, I particularly hated Descartes. I mean, I really found him such a bore. But the thing is, 
liberalism has an operating unit and the operating unit is the individual. That's what it is. Um, and you can track back, I mean, the, the obvious place to start is Kant, who actually doesn't even figure in the book at all, um, who sort of starts sort of playing with, with ideas around the individual. Or, of course, you can go much, much later with John Stuart Mill, Harriet Taylor and all that. But in terms of sort of the existential truth of the individual, in terms of the idea that it is the grounding, not just for politics, but for everything that we can know certainly to be true, the reality is it's Descartes that does that. And he does it with, you know, with the cogito, cogito ecosum, with I think, therefore I am, which is, you know, this moment of you can doubt anything in the world. You can imagine you're in the matrix, you're being fooled, you're being blustered. You can doubt whatever you want. But if you are doubting, you cannot doubt that you exist. So there is one thing and only one thing in the world that is absolutely certain, and that is the existence of the individual. And he goes out a little bit further from there to go, well, what kind of a thing is the individual? And his answer to that is, it's a thinking thing. It is, you know, my doubting means I'm thinking. So therefore I can conclude two things. I'm an individual and I'm a thing that thinks. And in fact, you can go further and go, I'm a thing that thinks rationally. So at that moment, you get the individual and reason and they're born as one, as one thing. And that seems to me to be like basically this moment that the sort of basic operating units of liberalism just splutter into life. So look, none of this is... if. None of this is the conventional approach um, to the subject. Lots of the stuff I do later on is, in the book is much more conventional. But it does seem to me that it's this pivotal moment where the old world dies, where the idea that the church and the state are the only certain things and the individual doesn't exist, that just crumbles away. And instead, you get these liberal operating units. And much to my annoyance, you know, that comes from Descartes, twat that he was. That was an absolutely pivotal moment in, in human development. So you've got to hand it to him he's been useful for something then yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah he's overall been a useful guy yeah <laughs> brilliant so you move on to it to explain the impact of the levelers uh the english levelers and their struggle with king charles i and you say liberalism did not exist yet yet its starting assumptions were now starting to emerge half formed in a cauldron of dissent tell us about this period and its contribution to liberalism yeah, this period's bad. And, and to be honest, like I, so the, the, because the book has got this really wide ranging, long sort of narrative to it, I got a pretty good um, dive into a lot of different historical areas. If you had to tell me right now, you've just got to pick one of those areas and that's the rest of your career, you're going to be dedicated to it. I think I would pick the English Civil War because it's fucking madness. Like, the, it's very, very old. I mean, it's it's just as radical, I would say, as I mean, I'd say it's arguably even more radical than the American Revolution. Certainly more radical than the Glorious Revolution in England, which is you know hundreds of years later. Well, sorry, beg your pardon, not hundreds of years later, a generation later. Not quite as radical as the French Revolution. But so 150 years before the Declaration of Independence, you get this moment in English history, which I kind of feel like we don't really get taught about. I don't, it never came up in my school. I, I haven't really met anyone who studied um, the English Civil War um, in their schooling. And it's just this moment where, I mean, you have a, a group of people, um, the New Model Army, in alliance with the Levellers, who take their own king hostage, who go to war against their own parliament, and who launch a mutiny against their officers. And in that process, they sit there and they formulate in the middle of that, well, caked in blood and mud, they formulate the, the starting principles of liberalism. The freedom of the individual, the idea of individual rights of like a sphere of protection around each person beyond which you are not entitled to fuck. So where if the state thinks that it knows what's better for you, it still doesn't get to touch you. Whether it's democratic di dictatorship, it makes no difference whatsoever. No one is allowed to interfere within that sphere and the starting ideas of democracy as well, of these two parts of the liberal project, these parts which actually don't necessarily always get on that well. And it's there, it happens with these guys, right in this chaos of civil war and, and battle and mutiny and kidnapping. So to be honest, you look at it and you just think, it's not so much, you know, it's not so much like, why, why would you treat this, this moment? It's like, why aren't we all talking about the English Civil War all the time? That is the, the staggering thing to me. And the personalities that you get out of it, I mean, John Lilburn, who's the leveler leader, is just this incredible kind of lunatic, again, a bit annoying. But he, 
it, there is no situation he will not go into without starting a fight. And in fact, there's a point where someone says, you know, if there were only two people in a room, sorry, I beg your pardon. If he was alone in the room, then John would be against Lilburn and Lilburn would be against John. He's just this incredibly stroppy bastard who nevertheless leads, de facto leader, kind of leads a movement that puts the operating mechanics of liberal democracy for the rest of the Western world in a moment that we hardly ever talk about. So it's, it's baffling to me we don't talk about it more. And, and I kind of hope that we, we rectify that pretty, pretty sharply. It's quite strange, isn't it? Because it used to be a very topic, um, a very popular topic to teach kids at school. I mean, I remember oh, really? talking to my dad who knew the English Civil War inside out. It was something that people were religiously taught. And then somehow it petered out. Why do you think people stopped teaching it? Oh, you see, I didn't know that. I didn't even know that they used to teach it in school. I've just never heard of anyone yeah. getting taught it. Yeah, um, apparently they used to do. So then obviously there was a political decision maybe at some point to stop teaching it. I'm not sure. No, oh, here come the conspiracy guess. theories. It's early. <laughs> but it must have been Thatcher's doing. Like, yeah, I wonder. I mean, there's maybe this, this sense of, um, we're having an argument on Romaniacs the other day about the monarchy. And I was doing my kind of centrist, then, you know, why would you bother with this thing when there's all this other stuff to fix? Kind of, don't really like it, don't really care though, you know, off we go. And my colleague Roy sort of said, actually, one of the reasons that civil war isn't taught is because it doesn't fit in to our mindset about what British history is, and especially English history. You know, that we sort of think of it as this sort of journey of kings. And you get this moment where they fucking kill the king. I mean, that's, and that's also weird to me that almost no one ever talks about that. And, and Britain then experiments with a form of republicanism, which turns into a kind of tyranny, but not in a obvious way you know this is the thing with Cromwell like I read quite a lot about Cromwell and no one really gets a handle on him so I think that's another difficult part that it doesn't have this it's not Cromwell's mercurial sort of presence in history which typified by the statue of him outside of parliament which for some people is like well how can you put a statue of this man there you know I mean he purged parliament so like, more than once um, you know he's the great dictator but also he was the great defender of parliament um, and in each moment that you see him, he's quite mixed. So I suppose it just, there's no easy narrative to it. But then what is exciting about that period is that there is no narrative to it. Like really it's, when you look at the way the levelers talk, like you want to look at them and think the king represented old authority, like ancient, the old way of doing things and the levelers represented progress. But actually those people thought about that shit exactly the fucking opposite way. The king thought that he was a progressive, that he was going to reform sort of taxisms. He was going to shake up the way the state operated. He happened to also think that he was God's elect. But that didn't change the fact that he thought of himself as representing the future. The levelers defined themselves as representing the past, not the future. They thought of themselves as harking back to some period of Anglo-Saxon freedom of like old English liberties, which doesn't really like a, a sort of hazy repository of freedom that existed basically sort of before the no Norman yoke probably but they could never really specify what it was so it just whichever way you look at it it doesn't fit but i think what's exciting about that period is it doesn't fit you know it's super weird it's very strange it's very shady it's very very chaotic and you get these sudden startling moments of very very new very aggressive ideas just bursting into existence it's kind of, it's it's gripping stuff not the book the period the book's all right. <laughs> Well, it's very gripping. And actually, one of the really interesting things about that period is the the importance of the free press, the, the burgeoning of the free press, as we understand mm -hmm. it. And, you know, tell us something about that, because, you know, that's the theme throughout the book, the importance to liberalism of a free press. And that's kind of where it starts, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I went, you have no idea, I lost my mind on the research for that stuff. In fact, I had to cut, <laughs> my editor cut most of that stuff out, because I just went down a rabbit hole. It's kind of fascinating, right? They, they have the printing press. They had the printing press for about 100 years earlier. So it's not a new piece of technology, not at all. The change that they come up with is instead of printing out lots of pieces of paper to put in a book, which only the nobility can afford, what if you just get one piece of paper? It's very large. I think it's about A3. Um, and you print on it in a variety of directions, and then you fold it up and you make a pamphlet. And that is basically the thing that later turns into the newspaper. But at the time, they're called paper bullets because you can produce these things at speed very, 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 very fast. Minimum of labor. You've got two guys sat there with like a bucket of horse piss, which they use to sort of try to stop it um, from overheating. They keep on wiping it down with horse piss, do it, turn it over. They can create sort of a few hundred copies in a night. And they have to do it that quickly because it's outlawed to, to make this kind of production. 
So very, very early on, um, Lord, who's the king's sort of enforcer, puts a ban on the number of people who can set type, the number of people who can own machines, the kind of material that you publish on those machines. And radicals understand quite quickly that they can use the black market. Most of these guys go underground, use the black market to start spreading their message. And they do. So people like Lilburn, who's in prison, who's sending out these tracks that he's writing, he's writing them at speed. Same with Richard Overton, the man who basically invents the concept of, of human rights, you know, writes this piece, Arrow Against All Tyrants in Prison, smuggles it out, goes to a black market printer, they churn it out and they just start throwing it around the streets of London, available for sale for about the price of a beer. London at that point, actually quite literate, surprisingly literate. Um, but even those that can't can listen to someone else in the alehouse, read this stuff out. And that's where it starts. That's where the newspaper starts. But that's also where the concept of individual rights starts in Overton's um, tract. That's where you get these incredible moments of liberalism. So with William Walwyn, for instance, you get him calling for freedom of religion for Catholics. Now, to call for freedom of religion for Catholics in Britain, in, the, in England, the pardon, in the 17th century is a, a kind of liberalism that is so far off the scale of anything we could comprehend today that it, it's, it's barely describable, an astonishingly courageous thing to do. And it comes through that. It comes from the very, very earliest moments of the free press. Mm, yeah, I loved it. And what was that text that Milton wrote? Ari, Aripagitica? Aripagitica. Aripagitica. Yeah, it's a bastard of a thing to say. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> but I loved reading about it, nonetheless. It sounded mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, let's move on to talk about the French Revolution. Mm. Because you point out, well, you sort of recount the intricate horrors of it. And you sort of show how difficult and damning it really was for liberalism after this kind of build up of people fighting for their most basic rights. What happened and why? Um, okay, so like this is a take and you know, you can read, oh fucking hell, you can read a lot of books about the French Revolution and everyone's got a different take on why that event sort of descended into chaos. Because it starts with a moment that I think is basically like a defining moment in human progress, which is the rights of man. Which is just a point where you go, you know, where that initial idea of individual rights from the English uh, Civil War, changes into no actually we're going to codify this shit now like we're actually going to write this out these are the things you can expect they'll be enforced by the state um and they're incredibly radical uh and it changes from there in a very very short period of time to the terror to a process that is initially an extremely anarchic sort of spasm of violence directed at numerous people i mean we think of it as just nobles and priests but actually many many the majority of people killed were actually normal average people mostly peasants very often just someone who was a bit strange a bit eccentric someone in the wrong village someone who was in between two passing armies and didn't remember which loyalty they were supposed to express at the right time um and then later a more structured form in the second stage of the terror a more structured form of social cleansing and then it really does turn predominantly against nobles and priests and starts to try and eradicate them kind of basically as a class um certain types of priests refractory priests rather than the one the other ones basically priests who had actually offered their oath uh, towards the new regime such as it was and my take on that is that it comes down to the separation of powers so really early in liberalism actually with the levelers arguably with the heads of proposals you get this moment where people say look there's a problem with the executive having all the control with the government having all the power so we're gonna have to carve it up and separate it and position it in different places. So we'll do it in the courts, you know, we'll do it in Parliament, we'll do it with the army, you'll put some with a kit, etc., and off you go. And um, that process never really takes place in the French Revolution. It, although they've got the literature on it, they've got John Locke who'd written about it, and then obviously they've got Montesquieu who'd written about it in, in a much more sort of much more articulate, much more mature, much more advanced way. The French Revolution, they don't really do it, and there's a couple of reasons for that. The first one is um Part of the sort of mechanism for how you get to the revolution is they all crowd into the Estates General, the sort of meeting place to hammer out France's problems. And one of the main fights they have is to say, well, we all want to sit together. We don't want to sit as three estates, basically having the clergy, the nobility, and what was essentially the commons, you know, the general. Um, they say, we want to vote together. And that battle means that they're quite loath to create a second house. England, for instance, has House of Lords, um, House of Commons, and the same thing in the US, you have a bicameral legislature. Their second problem with the separation of power is that the king can't be trusted. 
And they know that he's, you know, he's basically going, of course, I support your revolution, but any chance that guy gets, you know, he's going to, you know, plenty of foreign powers agitating to invade, clearly doesn't like it. He tries to escape at one point. So they end up with a situation where the executive kind of can't be really given any control and they're not willing to separate out the legislature. So suddenly all of the power is held in one place. It's held in the General Assembly. Um, and that makes it quite easy to take. And it is taken. And it's taken um, by this group called the sans culottes, who are, that means without breaches. It was, it was a reference to their sort of, you know, poor dress. I guess you translate it as scum, basically. Um, it's taken by them who were sort of treated as the watchdogs of the revolution. And they come in and essentially become the power in the French Revolution. And this goes back to a sort of old theory of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, which is the general will, which is the idea of democracy without individual rights. That all that matters is the people's will, the will of the people. This is a phrase that crops up again and again through the book that we hear on our own time over and over again from Johnson, from Trump, from Theresa May, over and over. And that was present there as this idea of whatever the people want, the people being whoever self-selects as the leadership class of the group, that's what happens. And that power is easy for them to take because there was no separation of power. And that process, under my argument, leads to what you see with the terror, which is just this blind, savage look for traitors at every turn, for criminals at every turn, for a complete lack of freedom. And so what happens at the end of the French Revolution to liberalism in particular? What are the arguments going around Europe? What do people think of it? That it was a waste of time? That the logical conclusion of, you know, the French Revolution was that? I mean, what, what do people think? It's exactly that. I mean, yeah. basically that it's tra the reputation of liberalism. It, it's not a word yet. Um, but the reputation of the idea of pulling down the old authority structures is completely shattered. So there's just this idea over and over again called individualism basically where writers just say, look, that is the source of all of our work. This is what happens when you break down authority structures. You lose all sense of control. People, um, it's almost this kind of Hobbesian worldview of, you know, people will just start murdering each other. They'll just start cutting each other up. We need the authority structure of the king, the authority structure of, of the church. You had the same thing with Edmund Burke, you know, in, in Britain, the sort of great founder of, um, of uh, conservatism making that case exactly, just saying, you know, the, the Commonwealth is long and fixed. The individuals just sort of float away with the wind. That the whole system is, is, is held to be completely disgraced and to be refuted. I mean, the attitude towards liberal ideas in the aftermath of the French Revolution is a, about similar to the attitude towards communism after the fall of the Berlin Wall. You know, just completely disgraced, no future for it ever again. So then along comes a guy called Benjamin Constant, who I had not heard of before I read your book, a little known figure, but you say you credit him with kind of reviving liberalism at this point. Would you say, is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I mean, I, I think he's probably, alongside Harriet Taylor, who comes up later, like one of the most underestimated human beings in, in the history of ideas. And, and part of that is because he's such a moral disgrace, right? So, I mean, and, and he is. I mean, that is completely legitimate. Like, he, he is a maniac and he's a bastard. Like, if, you know, he betrays every friend he ever made. He it tries to sleep with every woman he meets. I mean, regardless of the marital status. And he mostly fails and he sometimes succeeds and he has to run away because the husband's after him or, you know, the woman's after him. Someone's after him. When he's not running away from those situations, he's running away from his creditors. He has a lot of money, but he's a rich guy and he just wastes it away, just gambling and gambling, gambling. The thing is, he starts doing this stuff, I think when he's about 13, it's the first time he has to escape from a city, to escape both the consequences of a love affair and gambling. It's still happening when, you know, when he's sort of 50, 60 years old. He just cannot control himself. He's an, an absolute disgrace. So he's treated as a moral abomination in his own time. He then later kind of becomes a punchline amongst academics about the Napoleonic period, and he's just forgotten about in art. But then when you get to the text, you get to what he writes, principles of politics applicable to all governments. It's astonishingly mature, astonishingly restrained. Like none of the personality that he has um, in his personal life is reflected in the text, but he does draw on his personal experiences. And his personal experiences are quite strange you know there he's um his friend says to him at one point i found this quite beautiful she says like i've noticed that as soon as you express a feeling it is on the verge of disappearing 
So, you know, he has these love affairs where he's desperate. I mean, he, he goes crazy. Every time he falls in love, you know, he tries to commit suicide. In this quite showman sort of way in order to prove his love. He writes multiple love letters every day. He's, you know, he's very excessive over it. But as soon as the woman he falls in love with shows interest in him, he loses interest and he feels suffocated. He has to escape. And it seems odd that that kind of juvenile psychology should have any part in the formation of the most mature political system of thought in human history. But it does. Because what he takes from that is that no, you can't ever tell another human being what's good for them. And no one has the right to do that because his ultimate conclusion is, I don't even know myself. Like I am, it's basically because I am all over the place. So on no possible basis could anyone possibly instruct me on what would actually be better for me. And that leads him to sort of create a, or put a real emphasis that hadn't existed beforehand on the absolute primacy of, of the freedom of the individual. So the individual gets to do whatever they like and you can get the fuck out of their way. Like he has, he's the first person to use that kind of terminology up until that point before constant, you're dealing with the, 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 the furnace, like you sort of said before, the furnace of ideas. At that point, you start getting solid objects coming out. And those objects are liberalism as we know it today. So he is, I mean, a tremendously valuable person in the history of ideas. And the fact he doesn't get more credit is a bafflement to it, to me. The thing is, he does kind of deserve it because he cocked, he cocked shit up the whole way through. So his reputation is, is deserved for it as well. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Well, somebody else that's generally left out of, well, to some extent, the story of liberalism, or perhaps her significance is, is Harriet Taylor, the partner of John Stuart Mill. And you've really spent time rewriting her into the narrative in this book. Why was it so important to you and also to liberalism to do that? Well, I think, first of all, because just objectively, she deserves it. So, I mean, we, we have notes. Here's, here's the difference between how you treat these two figures, right? John Stuart Mill, you could build fucking libraries, like libraries of multiple rooms on the basis of all the works written about him. Harriet Taylor, we've got nothing. Like a lot of it was burned after her death. Don't really know the circumstances why. It's perfectly likely before we come up with sort of more sinister motives that she may have asked for it herself. Um, and in fact, there's some evidence that that's the case. But all we've got really are these scraps of paper and Unlike, you know, everything else is just written in scholarly tones, you know, with these sort of, you know, fountain pens in, in by beautiful desks. All of her writing is done um, in the back of a carriage, scribbled on the side of a bit of paper and then on the other side as she's just trying to get everything down. A lot of it comes through these pieces of paper that hold one part of a conversation, which predominantly um, with her daughter, sometimes also with uh, John Stuart Mill. Um, where we only get one half of the conversation. So she was probably at a show, like at a music show or something, or she may have been in a dinner party and they didn't want anyone hearing. And we just get her bit of the conversation. So these are the scraps we have to put together to piece together what she thinks. But what do we find in those scraps? We find uh, many of the ideas which about two decades later find their way into On Liberty, which is the classic liberal text, the sort of the Bible basically of, of what liberalism is. Um, and that seems to me a remarkable thing for people to forget. We found the core ideas on autonomy as um, a good life, as basically that a good life for a liberal is choosing your own life, regardless of what it is that you want, not following the crowd, engaging in your own act of self-creation, regardless of social pressure. We find those ideas initially in her writings. We find ideas around eccentricity in her writings as well. And we find the initial... Um, sort of criticism of liberalism and of society in general for the way that it treats women, which is, as I said, an irony, because of course the fact that she is not as well known as John Stuart Mill right now is specifically because society hates women. Um, and she starts putting together um, the, essentially the opening arguments for feminism. There's no other way to put it. I mean, there are other figures you can pick to look at in sort of similar periods, but ultimately you look um, at the emancipation of women, you look at subjection of women, these are the prototype feminist texts. And not only that, I mean, they're incredibly readable today. They're just this pulverizing machine gun of rage and sort of, um, and lashing out at injustice and combined, sorry, combined with logic and reason. I mean, it's not, you know, it, it's an emotional text, but that doesn't take away its structure from it. It is some of the best arguments you, you will ever read on any subject for any reason. That comes from her and that, by the way, is not just then about feminism. That is also about a school of liberalism, 
which is very distinct from the John, from, from the Benjamin Constant school, which is essentially radical liberalism or egalitarian liberalism, which is the liberalism that says it is not enough for us to treat the world as it is. That's often called laissez-faire, let things be. You know, just treat things as they are. We'll search for as much freedom as things are. Her position was completely different. It was no, fuck that. Like, we will tear shit up. We will start opening up the stones and finding out what's underneath them. We will try to change society as it functions in order to maximize freedom. And again, that comes from her. Now, I'm not trying to undermine John Stuart Mill in this. He was equal partner of it. The whole point really is that they operate as a joint fund of thought. I should mention, by the way, that John Stuart Mill is her husband. In case people are confused by that. Um, he's her later husband. They have a long love affair before that takes place. Very complex and tortured one, but a very beautiful one. Um, but that comes from her. And as if to reveal the fundamental truth about which she spoke, she was then erased. And she wasn't just fucking erased. She was berated. She was slandered. She was, um, in, her own, in her own time and ours, treated uh, just in the most despicable way, you know, branded with all the worst accusations you can throw at a woman for absolutely no reason at all, on the basis of no documentary evidence whatsoever. And ultimately then just forgotten. And she would have predicted every step of that. And in fact, anyone could have when reading the works that she herself wrote. Yeah, it's so tragic, really, thinking what she might have gone on to do if only she, in her time, had been recognised. But hmm. I guess you're remembering her now, I suppose. But yeah, I thought that was particularly interesting to the book because, again, somebody that I'd learned about in school, in history, but, you know, her prominence had never really been shown. And I was taught in a girls' school where you think these things were, well, these, these things were kind of flagged up if they were, you know, popular. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, hopefully you're going to change the kind of narrative with that, I think. So about midway through the book, about chapter six, you really <coughs> demonstrate how both communism and fascism destroy faith in liberalism and, you know, the terrible consequences of those regimes. In particular, you very movingly recount Hitler's treatment of the Jews. It's really beautifully done. Okay. Why do you think <coughs> that the lessons of communist Russia and Nazi Germany post that point weren't of enough of a per persuasion for people to stick with liberalism? Oh, I think they were for a while. I mean, I think we, we have that whole period really until the late 70s where um, liberalism establishes itself not just on social and political grounds, but on economic grounds. So where radical liberalism or egalitarian liberalism, which basically says, look, the state is going to start interfering now. You know, none of this idea of the market always knows best. We can't allow the kind of chaos that we saw in banking to happen again because it led to the Nazis, you know, because it encourages communist answers. And um, we, we can't allow people to just sit unemployed, for people to have insecure housing and insecure employment. Like, all of that needs to change. And that period, that, that sort of immediate post-war egalitarian liberal system lasts until the late 70s. And then it changes into laissez-faire, which is very, very strong on sort of social liberalism, on political liberalism, on individual rights, but has an almost sort of messianic belief in the primacy of the market. The market provides all the solutions. And I think that eventually takes us into our current moment. When we look at institutions like the EU, like the WTO, like the European Convention on Human Rights and represented in Strasbourg, what we're looking at is the world that liberals built after the Second World War, when we got these two monstrous ideologies that aimed to destroy the individual. And that was not, you know, this is the thing that we sort of, that was a conscious decision in both cases that the individual will be destroyed in the one case on the basis to represent race and on the other to represent class and that the individual within that just simply didn't matter what mattered was and again this goes back to Rousseau just like we saw in the French Revolution the cyclical nature of these things is, is extraordinary although each time because of technology it does seem to involve a higher body count something which troubles me quite a lot at the moment and um, again you see the the individual does not exist the people are a hom homogenous mass, Nazi case on the race leadership and on the Marxist case on the class leadership, and they are represented by one person, typically one man, in fact, pretty much always one man, um, who can channel up the people's will through some kind of mystical identification. And of course, what that really results in is just individuals being killed, because you can't make, you know, individuals do not make a homogenous mass. So instead, what happens is anyone that doesn't fit this view of how, of what the people should look like, is eventually, you know, is persecuted and eventually killed. And there is a recognition of that. And in fact, that recognition goes so far that when we had, when people had discussions about things like 
sharing sovereignty, which is something that the EU requires, you know, that each country will give up a little bit of control. And in exchange, it'll get you know, very fixed trade networks that, that um, prevent really war from being a very attractive proposition. They make it essentially illogical and in some cases unthinkable. Um, that we get an increase of material wealth people, that we have institutions outside of the state, for instance, in Strasbourg, which can protect individual rights. So you get rid of that very strange relationship we had in individual rights, going all the way back to the rights of man, where the state is tasked with protecting the rights to which it is the greatest threat. In all of those cases, they involve a sharing of sovereignty and a little bit of chipping away at sovereignty. And that was a sacrifice people were willing to make because they understood the consequences of what happened when you don't have a liberal rules-based system. In our own period, that understanding has started to fade away. Yeah, absolutely. So can we talk about identity politics? Mm, you... Oh, great. Oh, joy. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that everybody seems to have well, lots to say, lots to say about, and certainly you write very well about the the emergence of identity politics, which is something that lots of people probably don't know about. You know, they're so focused on everything being woke and the state of the BBC. So tell us about identity politics. You know, how it came to be, why it's kind of so nefarious to liberalism. So identity politics arises really in I'd say it starts sort of in the late 60s, but really the sort of core moments are, are in the 70s. You got stuff like the Kumbahi River Collective um, in the US. To a group of um, black lesbian feminists who keep on sort of cutting down the forms of oppression that they face. So they initially, you know, face racism. So you join black rights movements, and then they found, well, actually, you know, we're facing sexism as, as well. So in fact, they start sort of going into a group that's mostly sort of black women, and then they found, well, actually, there's homophobia, and it, it had to be a group like this. So basically, what they found was they were being let down by everyone. So they put out a statement, the Combate River Collective Statement, which is actually quite a beautiful piece of work and done by people who've been routinely ignored by everyone. But even now in society, you say things like that, like, you know, black lesbians, and people will sort of scoff and laugh. And realize, well, there's nothing to scoff and laugh at. You know, like, these are people who are being sort of attacked on every front. But they come up with something which is slightly different to the kind of politics that we'd seen up until that point. Because up until that point, when you look at the 60s civil rights movements on gender, on race, you had mostly seen people say, um, we search for universal rights. That essentially, you know, black people should be treated the same way as white people. That Asian people should be treated the same way as, um, as white people. That we should have equal rights for each individual. And that is a liberal theory. The idea was something slightly different. He said that their politics comes from their identity. And that suddenly raises some quite troubling questions, which then germinate up into the present moment. And I think explain why a lot of us, when we, when we look at parts of sort of um, efforts on the left for marginalized groups, feel very supportive and then also sometimes very alienated. Because there is a distinction between the two views of the group. One of them is um, we appeal to universal human values. The other is um, marginalized groups form their own homogenous blob just like class under communism, just like race under Nazism, that in fact, we're once again giving up on the individual and you can describe all groups within this in one category. My argument in the book is that basically this gets you into quite a difficult situation. It gets you in a difficult situation in a left-wing way and a right-wing way. Because as before, whenever you talk about the homogenous mass of people, you get one person standing up to lead them, to claim to have this mystical identification with them. Well, on the right in Britain, identity politics did that um, quite effectively. Because what it did, once it was translated into local government funding, as it was during the 80s, sort of for the Greater London Assembly and in various places, um, especially in the Midlands and North, um, was it started turning local government into a delivery system for money on the basis of identity. And so you suddenly got these groups emerge, you know, the, the Asia group, but typically through the mosque and through local businessmen who could claim to represent the entirety of their identity group. Now, of course they didn't. Now, what about the young uh, teenage lesbian, you know, in that community who these people said simply did not exist, who had been whitewashed away. Well, she didn't class as the people. Right? She didn't class as that group. And we get the same thing on the left where um, what we call adaptive preference in feminist terminology, which basically means, you know, people within a marginalized group, especially women, um, who start to embrace the more limited set of options that they're given. So, for instance, one of the feminist arguments is that that's what we see with women in the caring professions. You know, that you get women that have been given more limited options, they would embrace those they have. 
and sort of kick back against those who, who say otherwise. Well, whichever way you cut it, many marginalized groups, whether it's by ethnicity or, or gender or sexuality or anything else, have very diverse views. You know, many of them have quite right wing or quite conservative views. And they instead are now talked over and whitewashed away by a sort of leadership class in, in left wing identity politics, which is mostly composed of campaigners and academics. And you say, well, I, I talk on behalf of the group. And you think, well, actually, the, the group thinks many things at once. So although identity politics looks very fresh, looks very new, actually, it speaks to a process that is very, very old. And once again, I'm sorry to keep on doing this, but it's basically what this goes back to Rousseau and the French Revolution. <laughs> um, and ultimately has that group versus individual in it. Now, I, if I could, I know I've been speaking quite a while about it, but I do want to add quite one quick addendum to it, which is that groups do exist, marginalized groups exist, and they exist in a couple of ways. Firstly, on the basis of the characteristics by which they are oppressed, on the restrictions of their freedom that exist. And they secondly exist insofar as the individual within them chooses to associate with that group because of its heritage, because of the history of resistance, because of the music, the cuisine, and all of that fits within liberal theory. The moment that you break away from liberalism is when you start treating people as a homogenous mass on the basis of their characteristics. And that's when you get into a difficult area. And right now, lots of the social justice battles are caught in a way that people aren't properly articulating between liberal ideas of the individual and the individual's rights and the individual's right to fight oppression and to be protected from oppression. And another much bleaker idea, which is that they're fundamentally homogenous with people who happen to look like them. But obviously, you know, I would say identity politics for some people or identities perhaps, not identity politics, have been important for certain marginalised groups because they just needed to feel that they have some, somebody has their back, right? Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. And that's that second part that I was talking about under liberalism, yeah. which is um, exactly the same argument as you get for liberalism's argument for patriotism, okay? which is to okay. say, let, let me put it this way. Liberalism puts its emphasis on the individual. So whatever the individual wants matters because the individual thinks it. So the individual has a right to associate very strongly with whatever identity that they have, whether it's you know waving an English flag or a French flag, or whether it's on the basis of their race or their sexuality. Whatever form of identity matters to you as an individual freely chosen, liberalism encourages, and I would say, protects your right to express it. That liberalism is fundamental mm. to feeling that identity. That, however, is a different point to the one of saying that people of some identity have the same politics by virtue of it and therefore become homogenous. And that second aspect, which is essentially the homogenous blob imposed from above, rather than the sense of um, your association of your heritage that springs from within, that part is much, much more troublesome. And when you look at the kind of arguments that we get into now on things like um, cultural appropriation, it takes it intrinsically the idea that actually people are homogenous on one side and that there are very thick walls between cultures, very thick walls between groups that they do not share. And that I think is kind of indicative of the point where, where liberal ideas around the primacy of the individual have been slightly forgotten. Mm, mm, yeah, absolutely. So one of the things you explore really well at the end is the, the growth of nationalism and the fear of immigration. And these two things go hand in hand. In fact, they, you know, the fear of immigration is kind of used as a tool, isn't it, for people who are nationalists wanting to advance their agenda. You know, you explain really well the, the problems that we've had in Europe. We've seen them ourselves. We've seen the images of the little boy, you know, dead on the, the beach, etc. How does liberalism fight back against this fear of immigration? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, my view is that we're in this position because we gave up on our values. And we allowed them to fossilize. We didn't defend them. And in fact, liberalism got itself into an incredibly complacent position. A, a position that it's got itself into again and again. There's, there's one myth which seduces liberals, I think, more than any other. And that is um, the myth of a direction to history. And it takes them on, especially in the Victorian period, just before World War I. And then World War I wakes them up from that pretty fucking quickly. Um, and again, in our own period, this idea that, well, things will just keep on getting more rational, more liberal, you know, social, the idea of social freedom is now fully accepted, you know, pretty much anywhere. Um, and I remember sitting in pubs and having that conversation myself. Like we would sit there, we would, uh, you know, we would talk about, well, we're losing the economic fight, you know, since the 70s, but at least on the social liberalism, you know, there's no one that challenges in that. Uh, how fucking complacent and wrong could we possibly have been? History has no direction. It can change at any moment. 
But because we believed it did, we became complacent. We fought for the rights of immigrants in the courts. That was our main thing. And that's what we, and we were fucking effective at that shit. Like, you know, we could win it. We could win it on the basis of predominantly sort of um, ECHR uh, law. And we could do it again and again. And we thought, you know, we can do this. We would have constantly, you know, throughout even, you know, the new labor period which is now considered the sort of glory years for, for, you know, freedom of movement and all that. Actually, you remember the kind of rhetoric the new Labour government came out of against immigration. It was extremely pernicious, extremely brutal. In terms of the rhetoric, they always supported that side. And again, we weren't fighting the arguments. We, we relied on civil servants and business leaders close to government, hush, hush, away from the public eye going, you know, you can't do that. It's bad for the economy. So we're going to have to keep it open. So we got decades of government saying we're going to reduce immigration because immigration is bad and immigration not being reduced. And then suddenly, you know, people like me were suddenly surprised when everyone's like, well, we're gonna get rid of freedom of movement now. And we don't care if we have to decimate the country's trading networks in order to do it. But of course, how not? Because we hadn't been making the case. We weren't making it on TV. We weren't making it in the newspapers. We weren't making it in the office when we talked by the water cooler. We weren't making it across the dinner table. We weren't making it in the pub. We just lost contact with our values. And that, I mean, when you talk about that in political science terms, that's often given a name and it's called framing. So, you know, that whichever discussion you're having takes place around a particular frame. And for the whole of my life, that frame, whether we liked it or not, was essentially a nationalist frame. It was immigration is bad. You know, asylum seekers are typically criminals. They're kind of getting trying to get in under the system. I don't remember anyone talking about why the Refugee Convention existed and the sort of abject horror that happened to people that inspired that, that convention. Not at all. So to me, we lost contact with our values. And the way to fight back is to reaffirm our contact with our values and use them in the argument to change the framing. It's not enough to just try and smuggle it in, to use courts, to use kind of mercurial political language, for us to have labor leaders who go, oh, don't worry, we'll be all right. You know, you know we're better with immigration than the Tories, but I still have to say all this stuff. Whatever. That's not good enough. We have to fight for our values. So that to me is, is the first staging place of how we do it. We also have court battles. We also have all that stuff. I'm not ruling that out. And immigration lawyers, many of whom are my personal friends, so I'm now going to quickly make sure I'm not offending them, <laughs> you know, do tremendous heroic work. But that cannot be the only source of the battle. It has to be in mainstream political debate as well. So I'm going to try and wrap up and move on to the questions because there's just so much to ask you. But yeah, I, I think other people have got loads to ask as well. Um, you take us through the 2007 crash, through the Brexit referendum, and then you get us to the place that we're at now where we've got people like Donald Trump and Dominic Cummings having no compunction about lying to the public and the public not minding. They don't seem to mind that much. Or they, they don't seem to have a problem that much with lying, a lot, a proportion of them, a proportion of them. Hmm. And, you know, this is, this is kind of, lying isn't a reason not to be in power anymore, is it? So how do we get people to care about the truth again? I got asked that earlier today, and my answer is, is not so distinct, um, but it is like a little bit, and um, has a couple more steps than the last one. Say, so, notice the way that when these guys attack truth, they never just attack it on its own. It's always through the mechanism of tribalism. In every single case, you think back to that classic lie that 350 million to the NHS, beg your pardon, to the EU, was spent on the NHS instead. Now, think about what that involved. I mean, obviously it's false and it was done as a false thing in order to, to create argument. And, we, and we're not gonna delve back into that one because I think that's well understood. But it's based on tribalism, right? Us versus them, mm. us versus Europe. Exactly what we saw from uh, Boris Johnson in the Commons last week, when he says about the deal that he previously said was good, which he now says is bad, and which before he said it was good, before he signed it, he also said it was bad, changes over and over again about a border in the Irish Sea, which either does or does not exist, depending on what is most convenient to him at the time. But that's not how the debate happens. The debate happens by the EU are not, argue, are not negotiating in good faith. They're launching a food blockade against us. And almost as one, these obedient um, sort of little automatons the, on the Tory benches just stand up and say, and I watched the whole of that debate, fucking nearly bled me dry, um, to say, um, you're either with us or you're with the EU. That was actually, that's, I think, almost a direct quote from one of the Tory MPs. Said, you know, the people on the other benches have to decide which side you're on. So essentially tribalism. And that is an old process. That is a process that is ably described by um, George Orwell when he sort of writes, you know, this is the process of fitting human beings into categories of good or bad. And anything that's done on this side doesn't have to be consistent with the things we accuse the other side of, because what matters is our identity to the group, our allegiance to the group, rather than any objective fact. It's exactly the same thing that we see when we go back to those foundational values under Descartes, 
of saying that in, you exist as an individual, not as part of a tribe, not as part of a greater mass, as an individual. And you reason on the world on the basis of the empirical reality within it, not on the basis of your own sense of allegiance and identity. Now, when we win those cases, when we conduct politics according to that frame, according to those values, then we return to a world where the truth matters again, where evidence matters again, where memory is not considered some sort of old fashioned idea, but we are actually capable of remembering the things that the prime minister said to us just two months ago. And the fact that they are manifestly different to the things he's saying to us now. So on that basis, again, I'm sorry, my answer is always gonna be the same because it's basically the reason I did the book. It's just like we go back to our values. We win the fight over the frame of the debate, not just each individual instance of it. That makes perfect sense. And it's a fine clarion call, Ian. So on that note, I am going to open up to you, the audience, on Zoom and on uh, YouTube. Please send us your questions for Ian. I think it's worth reminding you at this point that Ian's book is for sale from us, the Salon Bookshop tonight. Um, it will get posted out after this event. And obviously, it's better than buying it from that retailer beginning with a capital A for obvious <laughs> reasons. I don't think I need to go into them. <laughs> and Ian is very sweetly signing copies of his book, live signing them for people that are on Zoom. And we're going to be doing that at the end. So I am going to go to the questions and I'm going to have to go over to my laptop now. This is a little bit inelegant, but hang on one second. Let me do what's coming through. One moment. Oh, please don't say people are being shy. That's impossible. <laughs> I feel like everybody will have lots to say. Here we are. Oh, so first question, Ian. Do you think, well, this is from Craig. Um, do you think one of the biggest problems that people have with liberalism is the word itself? It is not the underlying rights of the individual as such, just the word that describes it. Has the word itself become tamed today over time rather than the principles? I mean, the word get, I, you know, I, two years writing that book, right? And every time someone used the word liberal, you know, on Twitter or on TV or in an article, I just thought, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. This is not, this is not the stuff, right? And it's usually is an attack. So usually from the right, it's the classic, you know, oh, you want, you know, everyone to be prostitutes and wear hijabs and, you know, change their sex. You know, the classic, like, is this, this is what liberalism looks like. Um, which, by the way, liberals do want people to do that if that's what they choose to do. And the whole idea is pretty much you can do whatever you, you like, mate. Um, and people on the left using it as a shorthand for laissez-faire liberalism. This is an old thing on the left, but basically the only kind of liberalism that's sort of recognised in socialist circles to a lesser extent, and that's changing now in radical feminist circles, is um, laissez-faire liberalism, of basically just a free market idea, which is a school in liberalism. I mean, it is a part of liberalism. There's no point pretending they're not part of us, but that's not the entirety that it has to offer. Um, so yeah, it is used predominantly as a term of abuse. And I think that people, for a start, during that period of complacency, stopped using it about themselves because they kind of thought it was unnecessary, right? That idea to go, for, oh, well, we're all liberals now. So why would you bother talking about it that way? Um, and then later they stopped using it, I think after 2016, because they were afraid, you know, because to be called a liberal was sold as, well, you hate your country, right? You hate the people of your country. You're out of touch with them. You don't know anything. Um, exactly the kind of thing you would expect from a kind of politics that talks about the people as a homogenous mass while actually talking about 52% of them in a vote. And even of those 52%, you had incredibly diverse, eccentric, different views and trying to just wrap them up in what the government thought. So we stopped using it a bit and it mostly got left to its detractors. I don't think the word itself has a, a major problem. I actually think it's quite beautiful to have a kind of ism that has the word liberty within it because there is yeah. still no better word to describe what we do and when we when we deal with the different kinds of values that liberalism has like the most foundational one the most elegant one is still ultimately like the way that harriet taylor put it was the right of do as you please like th this idea that your fundamental approach towards life is freedom and that's not out of coincidence it's because it's from freedom that all other values become possible it is the foundational value which allows everything else that is worthwhile in life to flourish so on that basis, I would be left to give it up and not just because I've just written a fucking book with a name in it. <laughs> the titles are not particularly on side with that. Um, but because it has the word liberty in it, and I can't think of a more beautiful word in the English language than that. It's very nice. Um, 
we've got another question from Claire. She says, where does Scottish nationalism fit into your analysis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so it would be absurd, I think. And look, I'll pre cut sort of preempt this by saying that I'm not a fan of um, the idea of Scottish independence for, for, for some reasons that are technical and for some reasons that are sort of personal. And the personal stuff is I come from an immigrant British family. So for us, it's quite a common tendency in England to, among sort of immigrant families, to not really associate too strongly with England, which is seen as quite sort of singular and, and, and white, frankly. Um, and Britain is seen as, you know, the many things become one, the, the many flags come together. It feels like because, because it's got the notion of mixture within it, it's a more receptive concept to, to immigrants. Um, that is not something that's going to bother very many Scottish voters, and nor should it. But for my own personal stuff, I am who I am here. That's how I feel. I'm also not hugely keen to see what happens to England electorally once you take away that block of left-wing votes in Scotland. That makes it actually really quite hard to get the Tories out of a power at any time. Not hugely keen on it. However, it would be absurd of me to pretend that the SNP are similar to the nationalist parties that I talk about in that book, right? Like Donald Trump or Viktor Orban in Hungary. I mean, they're manifestly not. You know, these guys support international institutions much, much stronger, more strongly than our governments do. They don't attack the, the individual. They don't attack sort of individual rights. They do support human rights. I mean, it, it would be bizarre and sort of cheap to suggest otherwise. I do think that in the next period, as we build up to what I think is almost inevitable sort of a referendum on Scottish independence, no matter what Boris Johnson says, um, they are going to be faced with a series of political problems. The most easy answer will be to lie about them and to just disconnect from objective truth in the same way that the Brexit guys have. Right? So, I mean, they're going to, you're going to have the, the debate over the Scotland-England border is exactly the same as the debate over the Irish border we have been having for five years now, which is that, well, fine, if you want to separate completely on your regulatory structure, which you have to, if you're ultimately planning to join the EU, there's going to be checks on that border. You know, these are, there's going to be a series of bureaucratic checks that we're going to have to have. And the temptation, unlike last time when they published a white paper on independence during the referendum, and as you said, well, here's our plan. The temptation will be to do what the Brexiters do. And I think on the basis of that, you will see which of those instincts within the SNP w wins out. But ultimately, I have to say at the moment, I have a fair amount of faith in that party that even though I don't agree with the programme, it is deliverable in a way that still commits to objective reality and doesn't start getting into that will of the people horror story that we've seen um, in the rest of the country over the last five years. Absolutely. Claire, thanks for your question. Oh, right. OK, we've got some more here. Um, oh, yeah, actually, yes. Um, if you're a liberal worried about the trajectory politics is taking, what practical things should you be doing? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, to me, there's there's three levels of, of battle, right? I mean, the first one is um, the top level is within political parties. And this has, you know, regardless of where you are with party loyalty, if, you know, I'm not someone who ever wants to join a political party because they're fucking boring as fuck. Don't like anyone telling me what to do. But many other people don't feel that way. And many liberals are well positioned in political parties. And I know very many very good liberals who, who do want to be a part of a political party. It obviously doesn't have to be the Lib Dems, it can be Labour, it can be the Tories, it can be the SNP. And in fact, it's very useful when it is those parties, because that's where you can keep the internal battle for liberalism within it. And each and every one of them, there is a heritage of liberalism within all of those parties, of committing to the freedom of the individual. One of the great tragedies of our own period is seeing liberal conservatism die a death to the point where those guys were basically purged from the Conservative Party under... Boris Johnson. So those battles can happen within the parties, and that is the best way of affecting the national picture. The second stage is, to me, to find the issues that you care most about, whether that's immigration, whether it's um, drug law reform, whether it's penal reform, these are all liberal issues, whether it's free speech, whether it's human rights, um, and to join organizations who are campaigning for that and make yourself as useful as possible. Um, and that will be in a variety of ways. It could be through money, but it can also be through time especially with helping people with individual court cases, um, uh, to fight those battles there. But the third and lowest part, which to me is the most important, is you make the case. Like you have the fight. And we don't like doing that, right? Like we all feel like these arguments are a waste of our time somehow. You know, you're arguing with your father-in-law over Christmas, although you went, you know, one of the few advantages of the rule of six is that becomes vanishingly less likely in a way that many of us may celebrate. 
And you, you do it at work. You do it online. You have the fight. You have the argument. Now, each of those encounters matters. You can help change people's minds. You won't do it if you're just, you know, just full of bile and hatred and toxicity towards them. But if you put yourself in the position that John Stuart Mill and Harriet Taylor talked about, which is a position of both confidence and humility, humility to understand that there may be areas that you're wrong about, and that even if they're broadly wrong, there may be a half element, a trace element of truth, a sliver of truth in their argument, but also the confidence to say, I want to find the strongest arguments against my position. I want to hold up my values against and see if my ideas do stand firm. That combination, very hard to achieve, especially in day-to-day -day life, of confidence and humility will allow you to convince some people of other of your opinions. And in some cases, maybe some people will convince you of theirs. And those battles matter. And right now, that to me is the most important place. People having just that sense of dynamism in them and that sense of understanding the precariousness, the danger of the situation that we are in right now and having the fight wherever it comes up, trying to change people's minds. I think that counts, that really does matter. Fantastic. And final question of the evening, Ian, from Vicky, where did you get your shirt? <laughs> oh fuck i asked the, i asked the missus before i came here i was like is this an all right shirt for the for this kind of thing she was <laughs> well, it's just gone like, down brilliantly obviously really because she was just like i'm not so sure it is but i was like <laughs> in the heart so if it was the only one i think it's you from don't... next i think it's from next or something i'm i'm not <laughs> even sure. i know saying next makes me sound like such a basic bitch <laughs> no i, I love it a, i love I it Absolutely terrific. You're too busy thinking about liberalism. That's that's how I think. Exactly. It, yeah. I really just need lots of shirts like this, like Einstein, so I can just spend my whole time <laughs> thinking about liberalism. And that be it. Exactly. <laughs> well, on that note, I am going to say thank you to our YouTube audience for tuning in. We hope you really enjoyed this session with Ian. Really important is that Ian's book is for sale in the Salon London bookshop. Ian, can you hold up your book? Do you have a copy of it? Fucking hell. Wait. Yeah. No, I do. Hold on. <laughs> Because I do, but if I move, oh, I'll get you to move instead. No, I do because I actually had to, this is embarrassing, but I had to look up something in it to use it in an article recently. And I was like, Don't worry, I've been there. You'll be doing it for the next five years at least. It's true. Wonderful. So there's Ian's brilliant book. Please buy it from us, as I said before, because it just helps break the chain of evil, as I like to put it. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> if you on Zoom are waiting to get your copy signed, then please stay with us. Otherwise, anybody else on Zoom, good night and thank you for joining us. And for anybody else watching, good night. The salon is now closed. Cheers, guys.